All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for taking the time to be with us this evening. Uh, it takes a special kind of person to spend the tail end of a lovely afternoon like this in a, you know, aggressively blue windowless room like this. But uh, I think you made the right choice. Uh, my name is Michael Sutherland. I'm the editor-in-chief of the SICE Review of International Affairs, the official academic journal of Johns Hopkins SICE, and the uh, flagship publication of the Foreign Policy Institute. Since it was founded in 1980, it's been the goal of the Foreign Policy Institute here at SICE to unite the worlds of scholarship and policy in an effort to search for realistic answers to international issues facing the United States and the world today. Now, as attested to by today's turnout, we're here to talk about one of the most cons consequential issues facing the United States and the world today, the ongoing trade conflict with China and China's changing role in the international financial system. Now, China's evolving role in global trade is felt in every corner of the US economy. In my home state of Nebraska, which I tend to think of as being far, as far away as possible as you can get from all of this in DC, uh, they've suffered close to a billion dollars of economic damage that's been attributed to the ongoing trade conflict with China alone. So this issue is wide ranging, very complicated, and incredibly consequential to the United States today. But thankfully, we're about to hear from someone who knows far more about this issue than I do. Dr. John Lipsky is a senior fellow of the Foreign Policy Institute of Johns Hopkins SICE. Before joining SICE, he served as the first deputy managing director of the International Monetary Fund from 2006 to 2011. Previously, he served as vice chairman of J.P. Morgan Investment Bank and chief economist at several leading financial institutions, including Chase Manhattan Bank and Solomon Brothers. Currently, he is co-chair of the Aspen Institute's program on the world economy and also serves on the executive committee of the National Bureau of Economic Research and on the advisory board of the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research. He holds a PhD in economics from Stanford University and is a life member of the, of the Council of Foreign Relations. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lipsky to the podium this evening. Thanks for that very nice welcome. Now let's see. If I stand up straight, can you hear me? The mic works, good. Occasionally, that doesn't work. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, this, uh, just like to say that this talk this afternoon is based on one that uh, I gave. Uh, it's an updating of a talk I gave in January, Chinese University of Hong Kong, at the invitation of uh, Terence Chong, and uh, who was the executive director of the Lao Chartak Institute of Global Economics and Finance, and Larry Lau, who's the former rector of the uh, of the Chinese University. Uh, I'm going to admit to having uh, made for today a kind of rookie error. I've got too much material, too many slides for the time allotted, so we're going to go pretty fast. Uh, but you will find that I have, on purpose, used uh, materials from uh, recent, basically, or almost exclusively, used graphic materials from recent IMF publications. First, because they're, they've, uh, the IMF has done very good work analyzing especially the financial sector in, uh, in China and its challenges, and also that this material is easily accessible to all of you. And I highly recommend that you take a look at the recent work that they've done accessible on the IMF website, imf.org. Well, that works. Basically, although I have four dots here, we're going to have three, three broad topics. First, we're going to talk a bit about the recent developments of Chinese financial markets in the context of, uh, of the broad development of the uh, Chinese economy. Secondly, I'm going to talk about both the foreign participation to date in Chinese financial markets and the reverse, China's participation in international markets. And then we're going to talk about the prospects as affected by trade conflicts and the interaction that I see between the development of, uh, of uh, trade relations and the recent trade talks uh, underway, notably between the US and China, but also with other countries, and the development and role of China's financial sector and, its, uh, and China's uh, uh, participation in international financial markets. So away we go. First, let's take a look at uh, a few salient points. Here's something that's well known. China's savings rate. Here, on, here you see, uh, for 2017, uh, China against a, a bunch of other countries. You don't have to uh, look closely. That red, that red bar is China. Uh, next to it is Singapore, where 
there's a forced savings, really, through the pension system. Uh, but you can see that China's savings rate is just uh, exceptional uh, within, the, uh, within the world. Uh, why? Well, essentially, a reflection of policy. One, uh, a long-term policy of, first, a repressed financial sy uh, system that offered very, for many years, extremely low returns to, uh, to financial savings. And second, a very limited social safety net. So households especially uh, felt the need to save in exceptional amounts. In addition, when we look to the development by sector, here we can see that savings rate over time uh, from 92 to 2016. Red is households. Yellow are uh, non-financial firms. And the rest, you can see, hardly matters. So the point being that households relied on their own savings for their own, uh, their own self, uh, social safety net, if you will, for their own purposes. And businesses retained earnings for their own, to fund their own investment, hence these really exceptional uh, savings rates. But here's something interesting. Here we're looking now at household savings rate over time. And this is all the way from 1955 to 2015. This may be a surprise. In other words, that the success or the period of rapid growth of the Chinese economy and development of the financial sector in China was actually associated with rising household savings rates not the reverse. What you found is, as incomes rose, that households felt compelled to save an even higher proportion of their income than they did previously. So you can see, even this runs through 2015, you can see even in the, uh, the post-crisis period that the sa household savings rate has remained extremely uh, high. Well. There was another fact of the post-crisis uh, period of, in the Chinese economy, uh, one that I think is uh, well known to everybody who's paid attention, and that is that one of the ways that China sustained and restored growth after the onset of the global financial crisis in 2007, 8, and 9 was through massive stimulus, especially expressed through the growth in credit. And here we can see, if you can see this, that the red bars are the growth rates in credit. The green bars are the growth rates in output. So if you can see that closely, the, uh, as we know, in 2008, there was a substantial slowdown in growth met by huge acceleration in credit growth, those red bars. That blue line shows you the credit intensity in other words, the amount of credit necessary to produce growth in GDP changed dramatically in that you saw credit growing explosively, not only in absolute terms, but relative to real growth. So there was restoration of real growth, but in a context of credit growth that clearly seemed unsustainable. What was the nature of the problem? Well, there was a lending boom to local governments to finance investment uh, in infra local infrastructure, to corporations to finance activity, and to households, especially to finance uh, purchase of real estate. In addition, this also brought, was associated with increasing complexity of the, system, of the financial system, in that previously the financial system had been dominated by a few large state banks, banks that whose uh, original source was more like uh, credit allocation uh, operations in a state-dominated or socialized economy, and were converting slowly into something that looked more like, more like banks. But typically, they operated by offering very low returns on deposits, and then were able to provide cheap credit to especially state, to particularly state-owned enterprises that, in essence, were an implicit subsidy being provided by households. 
naturally households wanted to try and others wanted to try to get away from that trap and they started developing so-called shadow banking or non-bank non financial institutions or mechanisms. And what you found was they were growing quite rapidly because they uh, offered so-called wealth management products that offered higher interest rates to private savers and hence were uh, in uh, great demand. And not surprisingly, if you asked where did they these non-bank institutions get the, get the capital or get the funds, the liquidity, to on-lend, the answer was, in many cases, from the banks themselves that found those were more profitable than to on-lend to, uh, to corporations or especially state-owned enterprises. So here was this rapid growth of credit in an uncertain institutional context in which the most rapid growth was in the form of non-traditional, non-bank institutions and uh, untested wealth management products that offered the, or created the uncertainty about the role of public guarantees. For those who know China's financial history are aware of the, the credit crisis in the banking system in the 90s, that essentially the bad debts were socialized. And uh, so the question, the open question remained, what was, what was state guaranteed, what was not state guaranteed. So what were the principal challenges coming out that were seen quite clearly by the Chinese authorities as well as others in the wake of the financial crisis in which it was the rate of growth was successfully restored, but as I said, and is obvious in a context and it was unsustainable as it stood. So here were the principal challenges, as, as, is, as seen by the uh, Chinese authorities. They needed to slow credit growth while supporting sector rebalancing away from investment and toward consumption. They needed a wish to restore the role of commercial banks in restricting this growth of non-bank financial institutions whose uh, role in the system was, uh, was uncertain. And they needed to accommodate rapid growth in the newly created local government bond market. In the, um, these, these reforms or these need for reforms were recognized quite clearly in the 13th five-year plan that was uh, promulgated in 2016, recognizing the unsustainability of, uh, of the, the current circumstances. And, uh, one of the reforms of the post-crisis, uh, post-financial crisis era was the requirement that local governments make use of these newly created local government bond instruments instead of bank credit for, uh, for financing their own operations. The idea being it would be much more transparent and controlled and controllable. The goals of, this ref of the reform associated with the 13th five-year plan uh, were enhanced transparency of the system, enhanced stability of the system, and increased efficiency of the system. And it wasn't just words. There were uh, specific uh, policy measures that were uh, created to uh, produce the desired results. In broad terms, the idea was enhance the systemic risk monitoring of the system, that there needed to be greater interagency cooperation among the regulatory and supervisory institutions in China, that there was a clear need for increased bank capital, that institutions needed to create much greater liquidity buffers, and there needed to be much greater clarity regarding potential crisis management. So all of these reforms, so the, the point is a very simple one. It was clearly recognized not only by other observers, but the Chinese authorities, that changes of importance were needed. They were recognized in basic documents and given form in, uh, in uh, specific measures. Particular importance was the creation of, in 2017, of the Financial Stability and Development Committee, which essentially is a committee that uh, quite a bit like the uh, macroprudential uh, 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 committees created in the U.S. and the U.K. and others in the wake of the uh, financial crisis 
to make sure this one involves the head of the PBO, the, the people, the central bank, minister of finance, etc. All the most senior economic and financial officials are members of this committee that is required to uh, oversee the stability of the uh, and the development of the financial sector. The goal was, in essence, back to basics, a system that had become extremely complex and uncertain clar that needed clarity. But also, an, an aspect of the, uh, of the desired reforms were an opening up of the financial system to international participation. So all of these uh, uh, were all take these were taken in the context of the, uh, the post-crisis era. So let's take a look and see uh, what happened. Uh, if you can see, again, hopefully you don't have to read the details. I'll explain the, uh, uh, the, the graphs and they should be quite, quite clear. What you see on the left side is what happened to, uh, to, the, to the credit growth in the post-2017 period. Blue wealth management products, those are the, that's the shadow banking system. Growth rate show, slowing very sharply. Red line, interbank claims. Remember, the bank, interbank claims were one of the ways that the, uh, the shadow banking system got financed, slowing sharply. Green line there on the left, total social financing. Growth rate slowed sharply. On the right, bank assets. Now we're looking at traditional bank assets as a percent of GDP. First, I oh, was sorry, first the blue line on the right is the growth rate of bank assets. So you can see a very sharp slowdown. On the right is the total of bank assets as a percent of GDP. And you can see that rapid growth and uh, the slowing. By the way, if you, uh, in the back perhaps you can't see the, the numbers, uh, but total bank credit or total bank assets as a percent of GDP in, uh, in China reached nearly 300% of GDP. In other words, far in excess of any other banking system in the world. So the, uh, the growth in credit post-crisis was really unique to China. OK, so how has, has this supported uh, the, uh, the shift, sec the desired sectoral shift? Remember, slowing credit. Slowing credit, particularly from the non-bank, from the non or the shadow banking system, and su uh, supporting a rebalancing of the economy away from investment and toward consumption. Well, it turns out that this tightening uh, that was accomplished through various means, including regulatory tightening, uh, really hit the shadow bank credit expansion from the smallest banks. On the left, you see the net increase in credit from the biggest banks, and on the right, from small and medium banks. And what this graph shows, again, you don't have to read the details. On the left, that there was a slowing but continued increase in growth in credit from the largest banks. And on the right, you can see there is an actual decline in shadow banking credit from the smaller institutions. So that had an effect. But it also meant that it uh, hit particularly weaker borrowers. Here what you can see is this is 2014, 15, 16, 17, and 18. Those bars show you the amount of defaulted debt. The green line shows you the yield spreads between lower credit, between low credit private banking, uh, tri private bonds, and base government bonds, federal government bonds, uh, central government bonds. So you can see the yield spread increased. In other words, the cost of, of credit to weaker borrowers relative to, uh, to government debt expanded. So credit became relatively more costly. For, uh, for weaker borrowers, and there was a substantial increase in bond defaults. 
So this has produced a winnowing out of, uh, of weaker credits. But it also uh, meant that bank assets, which I already told you are at a not only at particular highs, but higher than any place else in the world relative to GDP, are still growing. So here we can see on the left side the total capitalization of the bond market in China, that blue line. So you can see it leveling out as we get to 2015, 16, 17. The red line shows you bank assets. They've leveled out. And stock market capitalization actually came down. If we look on the right-hand side, we can see as percent of global GDP, by the way, that means that Chinese and the red line is using the right-hand scale. The left-hand scale is for, the, uh, for bond capitalization, stock market capitalization. I don't know, hopefully in the back you can see the, see the numbers. Let me see. Bank assets is a percent of, of uh, world GDP. Chinese bank assets is a percentage of world GDP, 50%. Bond market capitalization, stock market capitalization, 8 to 10 percent. So it gives you an idea of the scale of what has happened to bank credit uh, in China. And so has this slowdown produced all the effects that was intended? Well, for one, it, we can see here that green bar shows you net, net borrowing from Wealth, uh, wealth management products, in other words, from the shadow banking system, they have continued to grow. They did not, they did not uh, uh, stop. And the, uh, this red line shows you here bank lending to wealth management products has also continued. So it hasn't been stopped. And when we look at who is doing the borrowing, what you can see essentially is here infrastructure and property firms, other non-financial firms, and retail. So you can see that the decline over here in, uh, uh, for property and infrastructure is much less than, uh, than for the other sectors. And here you can see, again, that there's continued credit growth from, uh, uh, from non-banks uh, to the property, in from the shadow banking system to the property sector and infrastructure, other forms declining. So exactly the forms, the area that, was, uh, that they wanted to cool down is continuing to grow, i.e. property and infrastructure. And why that is, uh, a bit worrisome is because here you can see that the leverage of the, of the uh, infrastructure and property firms versus other non-financial firms. So the firms that are the most levered are continuing to get the most credit. And when we look at the stability and uh, solidity of the finances of these firms, this shows you the, uh, a measure called debt at risk, which is the share of the uh, debt outstanding in which the borrower's income is less than their debt service payments, their interest payments. And here we have infrastructure firms fully, in the latest data, about 25 percent are not, uh, not they are uh, at risk in the sense that they are not, their cash flow, current cash flow, is less than their current debt obligations. These are the firms that tend to need to borrow to pay their own debt. So this is, these are infrastructure and property firms and these are other non-financial firms. So progress but, and the but is, you can see that the weakest sectors are still getting more credit. And despite the slower credit growth, that means that their overall leverage is still rising.
for the economy as a whole. Here we have corporate, government, and household debt as a percentage of GDP. And here we have household leverage, corporate leverage is still rising. So this has only been partially successful. And secondly, as we all know, there has, has been associated with a slowdown in overall growth in China that reflected, among other things, a slowdown in the, uh, at the end of last year in sectors like auto purchases and others. So some forms of household consumption spending have slowed substantially. Corporate investment, private businesses, also slowed because it turns out that they were that the, non, the uh, uh, shadow banking or non-bank fi, non financial sector is the principal source of credit to private firms, whereas the traditional state banks continue to be the principal source of lending for state-owned enterprises. And that means that state-owned enterprises are still investing, even though here we have uh, return on assets for private enterprise, state-owned enterprises. So they're much, the state-owned enterprises as a whole are much less productive, but their assets continue to rise. And that means that the, in, in essence, a problem that has appeared in the Chinese economy, despite the restored growth in the post-crisis uh, period, that despite investment rates that also, like savings rate, have been higher than anywhere else in the world of uh, investment to GDP of nearly 50 percent, that the growth in productivity has only been about average in recent years for emerging markets, another sign of the need for reform. So despite the efforts so far, the, as we can see, you're still getting, having problems in terms of sectoral uh, use of credit. And that's, as a result, it's not so surprising that the switch, sectoral shift toward consumption and away from investment in China has actually been, prog has been progressing, but progressing quite slowly. Here you can see a scatter diagram. This shows Percentage capital formation is a percent of GDP here, and consumption is a percent of GDP here. These are country observations. This is China in 2011, and that's China in 2016. So has there been progress in the sense of less investment, more consumption? The answer is yes, absolutely. But China is still in a different category than any other country any other large economy, any other economy, sorry. And there's still a problem, uh, a residual problem, that is hinted at by the amount of leverage and the, so that debt at risk uh, chart I showed you. And that is the, the persistence of so-called zombie companies. Zombie companies that are not profitable, are not conceivably profitable, who are producing negative return on assets, as a result, have uh, ceased to be able to invest, and yet whose leverage continues to increase because they persistently require new borrowing to cover old debts. So in essence, it's a kind of a Ponzi scheme, unless they can make improvements in their underlying uh, behavior. But this has been a persistent problem in the Chinese uh, sector, one that has been addressed in terms of the number of firms that are, can be qualified as zombie firms in this, in this uh, condition, but in fact the amount of credit that they are absorbing remains non-trivial. So this is another problem that, uh, that uh, hasn't been completely resolved. So big picture. There have been some sub a recognition of the problem. There have been important efforts, both in terms of policy and in terms of structure, 
creating new administrative structures, new authorities, etc., that are producing results, but have far from, from resolving the strains in the financial system. Long way to go. Now, I wanted to point out next next part of the financial system is how important the growth in the local government bond market has been to the Chinese financial sector, and you'll understand the implications. Here is a uh, size of fixed income markets in uh, uh, U.S. dollars. That's the U.S. That's the U.S. bond market, bigger than anybody else's. Here's Japan, that's second. Here's China in 2013. Here's China in 2017. So there's been huge growth, relative growth, in bond issuance in China in just the post-crisis period, essentially driven by the explosive growth of the local government bond market. So China now has essentially, call it the third largest bond market in the world, probably going to pass that of Japan soon. And here's the growth you can see year on year growth in percentage. This is in percent of GDP. Here's the central government bond market. Here's the local government bond market. In other words, a huge shift in financing away from bank borrowing and other forms of borrowing towards these local government bonds. And this debt is used to finance construction and infrastructure. Here you can see social housing, construction, land development. Essentially, that's what these, uh, these expenditure is, is going for. And there's been a huge growth, as you can see. Here's just another way of showing you. Here's the sovereign bond market as a pie chart of the whole. Here's the local, gov local government bond market. Here are corporate bonds. So it's increasingly important. And however, another aspect uh, of, the, uh, of the Chinese, uh, or one of the positive aspects, is despite all this, because the savings rate of the household is so high that the debt ratio of households is relatively low. So you, and here is an international comparison of household debt as a percentage of GDP. It's still relatively modest as the other forms have grown. Okay, so that's a snapshot of the uh, of the situation in the in the Chinese bond the Chinese financial market. Again, to recap, big challenges structural challenges that became acute in the wake of the financial crisis in which there was success in restoring growth but in a way that is financially unsustainable. The reaction that was encompassed in the 13th five-year plan in an attempt to uh, strengthen the underpinnings of the system to make it more transparent, clear, shift back to the, uh, towards the commercial banks, the traditional state-owned banks, and uh, the, through the creation of this local government bond market, a huge change in the structure of the system, but one that enhanced transparency uh, and hopefully efficiency. But at the same time, you saw that it was far from having solved the problems that, uh, that, were, that were evident in terms of the, uh, the degree of leverage and that the highly levered sectors are still getting more credit. This, is, this hasn't been resolved. Now I want to turn to the second part of my presentation, which is about China's role in international markets. I understand we're going through this quickly, but all of these themes could have been the t topic of a, of a whole talk. And here's the point, simple point which is despite this huge growth in the Chinese financial market, foreign participation remains extremely small. And at the same time, despite the presence of uh, and the uh, awareness of Chinese investment abroad, 
actually China's participation in their national financial markets remains quite limited so far, and in ways that are probably going to surprise you. Okay, so what we already said is China's bond market is internationally significant. Here's the U.S. again. Here's the whole euro area put together. Um, but, of course, there's no euro bond, euro area bond. Those are all sovereign bonds. Uh, these are just uh, denominated. Those are series of sovereign bonds from the euro area, Japan, China. Okay. But what is the foreign participation in China's stock and bond market? Here we have them as a percentage of the market size. This is from uh, 2012 uh, to, uh, oh, sorry, 2013 to 2017. Uh, here we have the um, bond market, stock market percentages, around 1.5% of the total market. So foreign participation in these markets is, I won't say trivial, but mi let's, let's be generous and say minimal. There's very little. And this is unusual even for the region. So here we have on the left stock market, bond market. Here's as a guide foreign participation in the U.S. stock market, around 30, about one-third. U.S. bond market, about one-fourth foreign ownership. And here we have, in, this is comparison with the region. Here in stock market, that's Korea. Bond market, much less. This is Japan, 16% in the uh, stock market, so 10% in the bond market. And then we go down, here's China. So you can see, by comparison even within the region, foreign participation in the Chinese domestic market is essentially, uh, again, I hesitate to use the word trivial, but minimal. And when we look at uh, foreign direct investment, what we're finding out is some developments that I think many people haven't been aware of. And that is, well, we'll I'm doing this a little bit backwards. Service restrictions uh, on services entry, service sector entry, is relatively difficult. In other words, here is uh, the OECD has a measure of the restrictiveness of entry of foreign firms into the service sector. That's China. Higher means more restrictive. Lower means less restrictive. This is the average for the OECD countries. That's the average for emerging markets. That's China. And this is a similar measure of regulatory, uh, re regulatory restrictiveness. Same measures. Point very simple. China is unusually restrictive on ability of foreign firms to participate in the service sector. And guess what's happened on the manufacturing sector? FDI has tended to go into export-oriented manufacturing, and China has lost competitiveness in this area. And so, perhaps surprising to most people, here's what's happened to FDI and to China. It's actually been slowing substantially. And now, this marks the 25th to the 75th quartile range of FDI into emerging markets. In other words, now FDI in relative terms in China is actually very low for emerging markets, not very high, because the, that export-oriented manufacturing FDI is going to Vietnam, is going to Indonesia, is not going to China. So it will take changes to get greater, uh, up, and as we saw, greater openness in the service sector, uh, greater uh, competitiveness in the uh, manufacturing export sector to reattract FDI. And let's flip it around the other way. What about Chinese participation in foreign securities markets? Well, here we have the international investment position of China. Here are liabilities and assets. Here's the U.S., Japan, Korea, India, China. Point being that Chinese participation in foreign markets is quite limited in percent of GDP relative to their GDP. So these are, uh, again, 
China, despite the publicity, in fact, is a relatively small player in foreign financial markets. And here's an area that you probably may be aware of, but may find surprising. First, let's look at trade linkages. This graph is uh, IMF developed to show, actually, the, this is trade as a percent of GDP. Trade is not a percent of total trade with China, as, not trade with China as a percent of total trade, but trade with China as a percent of these countries' GDP. So you can see that there's the commodity producer exporters, here are some in Africa, but even countries like Brazil and Argentina, commodity exporters that have very important trade ties uh, to China, actually as a percent of their GDP is not particularly great because those are relatively closed economies. Brazil's not a very, it's a big exporter, but the exports relative to Brazilian GDP aren't that big. So, but nonetheless, the, here's the point, that China has both broad and significant trade linkages, probably a little smaller when characterized in terms of GDP than you might have thought. But here's the main point. Now, if we look at those in terms of bank linkages, if you can see the color coding, it's really relatively restricted to just a small number of relatively small economies. And that is probably an, a number that is probably going to be surprising to most people. Despite the efforts to internationalize the RMB, the Chinese currency, and promote it, for example, as a, a measure of, of uh, or as a vehicle for financing trade, that actually the use of the RMB in settling their own uh, Chinese trade has fallen from about 35% in 2015 to about 20% currently. In other words, the use of the RMB, even in clearing China's own trade, has receded recently, not the other way around. So once again, there's a long way to go. But where, are we, where should we be going? <clears throat> Well, this is, a, this is a simple one. Share of GDP and their growth in GDP should create a natural prospect for increasing role in international markets. And they have announced a series, despite the skepticism, and perhaps you've seen some publicity from some, uh, even right around this neighborhood in Washington, of folks saying that there's been a big retreat from international openness and a, a refocus on state enterprises and away from market reform in China. In fact, at the recent National Development Forum uh, in, in Beijing, and as expressed here at SAIS by my former IMF colleague Ming Zhu in a wonderful presentation just a few days ago, who's currently running the Finance Institute at Tsinghua University, gave us a whole list of new market opening measures that China is undertaking with the notion that they are, among other things, permitting foreign majority ownership of domestic financial firms, something that was not permitted before, with the idea that there's the prospect of uh, a relatively rapid expansion of the so far minimal role of foreign firms in the Chinese market. Uh, but it has been pointed out that it's not just ownership that has restricted their role, but also regulatory and supervisory issues. And it's not clear whether those are going to be relaxed at the same time or at the same speed that the ownership uh, rules are being relaxed. So this remains uh, uncertain, even though it seems like a natural, if there is going to be continued market orientation in China's economic reforms. But what we have seen, as I described that surprising result for most, the decline in the use of the, of the Chinese currency for settling China's own trade, trade, uh, 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 trade deals, uh, that it was instability and volatility in markets post in, in late 2015 
and 16, in which the RMB fell in value in international markets, uh, that uh, instability, volatility, and par policy uncertainty certainly would inhibit China's progress in this degree. And it seems clear trade conflicts are a uh, direct way of influencing, for better or for worse, both market volatility and policy uncertainty. In other words, what I'm trying to say is something quite simple, that progress on tra in trade is going to be critical for the growing or shrinking international role of financial and foreign financial institutions in Japan, in China, or Chinese uh, institutions in uh, the rest of the world. That uh, slip for using Japan is because there are many parallels between the, uh, if you remember back in Japan's uh, rapid growth period and the expansion of Japanese financial firms around the world and their subsequent crisis and the shrinkage of those firms from international markets. So it's, a, it's not inevitable that the uh, uh, progress in a desired way. But it seems clear, opening the global markets to China were key for their unprecedented growth in the 1990s and 2000s. That it was international cooperation that helped to stop the global financial crisis in 2007, 8, and 9. But cooperation implies compromise, implies reaching uh, agreement on fundamental principles and on operational details. So that is going to be required to produce new progress. We all know that there are important negotiations underway. Uh, I don't have to, you can read about them every day in the newspaper. What you don't know is how much progress is being made. We know that the important issues are in, around intellectual property, protection of intellectual property, tri technology transfers, the role of official subsidies in things like the China 2025 program, uh, cybersecurity issues. We can all read about those uh, every day. And as we know, there's, uh, as we speak, a summit meeting on uh, Belt and Road uh, initiative underway in Beijing, uh, as we, uh, uh, right now. And there's a controversy and uncertainty about how to interpret Belt and Road in terms exactly of, is this a means of increased openness and engagement, or is it an, a, uh, an in, a measure of greater straight state control and less openness? Uh, we, will, we will see. There are, ways, uh, there are reasons to hope for progress. Obviously, China has, is uh, adopting a new foreign investment law that uh, means you ta told us about that was going to provide, again, much greater openness in terms of access to sectors, in terms of technology transfer, et cetera. So there's hope in that regard. Uh, the, both the, EU, the US and EU have uh, announced new investment review processes that were viewed as restrictive, but in fact, they could at least clarify rules uh, and uh, lead to greater certainty. And of course, we have the trade negotiations, not just between the US and China, but elsewhere. So there is prospect for progress. But there's a deep long-term issue that has to be addressed. And that is, if the future of Chinese economy is, is socialism with Chinese characteristics, if the Chinese economy is going to be, in its structure, different than that of the, of the OECD, other o, of OECD market-oriented economies, how will China in the long term fit into the international trade and finance system? Here, potentially, the role of the WTO is crucial. Um, there are three options. Either we come up with new rules in which we can uh, agree, define a level playing field for both the Chinese economy and their trading partners that everyone accepts as fair. That could come through a new treaty, but those don't look very plausible 
which is why the U.S. and others attempted to approach these issues through what either uh, mega-regional or call them plural, plural, plurilateral trade negotiations like, w, like the TPP with Asia and TTIP with Europe. The idea was to try to negotiate, to renew the Doha round or something like that with all the members of WTO was too complex. It was never going to succeed. But if we could come to kind of an agreement among smaller groups of countries that were still import, were very important, that that would promulgate and create implicitly create the basis for standards that would be acceptable. But there are aspects of the Chinese economy that are likely to be with us for a long time that are simply uh, not like uh, the normal, like uh, normal market economies as we think about them. The state enterprises, which um, in China report up to the state assets, the SASAC, which is the State Asset Control and Mis Administration Commission, which is essentially a holding company for the state enterprises, has no counterpart elsewhere. The large state banks are controlled by an organization called the Central Huizhen that was formed in the wake of the crisis in 2003 as a way to uh, control the banking system. There's no equivalent in, uh, in other OECD countries. There's uh, the national, uh, the NDRC, uh, the National Development uh, Commission that has controls over not only planning, uh, but uh, also the energy sector, pricing, etc. that has no counterpart in uh, OECD countries. So if ultimately, if that, if China, if the structure of the Chinese economy is going to retain Chinese characteristics, then eventually there has to be an agreement if we're going to have an open, fluid trading system on rules of the game that are seen as fair by both sides, fair and sustainable in the long run. What's uncertain is whether that's the, going to be the goal of the current negotiations uh, underway. There's another aspect for the a particular relevance for the financial system, and that is the reform efforts under the auspices of the G20's Financial Stability Board. So far, you would say that global markets are probably still more fragmented post-financial crisis than they were before the financial crisis. So once again, China's role is going to depend to some degree in the international markets on how reform in the international markets continues. Uh, there are big unknown uh, issues such as will there be completion of the banking union in Europe will in the, the Eurozone? Will there be a capital markets union? How will Chinese markets develop with regard to their regulatory reform? All these are open questions. But I come back to the and end on the simple point that the uh, most progress was made in a context of cooperation and openness and preserving a sense of uh, open markets and uh, compromise holds open the prospect that should be natural for an expanding role for China in international financial markets. But for the near term, it can't be taken for granted. It has to be achieved through specific agreement and progress. I'll stop there. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you for your remarks today, uh, Dr. Lipsky. Um, before I open it up to the floor, I'd like to capitalize on my position here and ask you one quick question. Um, there are rumblings lately that China may be facing a financial crisis in the near future. Um, if China were to face a financial crisis, say in the next five or ten years, what form do you think that might take, and you know what would the implications be for the international financial system as a whole? Well, I think the the if that 
the, the dangers of stability uh, for the Chinese financial system are, are fairly straightforward. Uh, one, we've had very rapid growth in the housing market and uh, uh, with uncertain underpinnings. There are those uh, who claim that there's a risk of a housing bubble and uh, that a downturn would have very broad-ranging effects on, uh, on consumption and on uh, household finances and, uh, and uh, confidence in, in general. Secondly, there's been huge infrastructure spending, uncertainty about the uh, economics, the financial soundness of the, growth, the very large growth in uh, the debt of uh, uh, public enterprises, such as uh, in tra the transportation sector, for example, high-speed high rail, huge expansion at rapid pace. Will they, will they uh, be able to uh, uh, finance the debts that were, uh, or pay the debts that were used to finance them? So there are some, some challenges going forward. And uh, even though, as I described in my, I mentioned in my uh, remarks, uh, the uh, need for greater clarity about crisis resolution if there were to be uh, problems and crisis management if there were to be problems is, uh, is still uncertain. So the, the risks uh, are, uh, are visible. Uh, the severity is, is unknown. And uh, the, uh, hopefully that the kind of progress and uh, the recognition that the authorities have had toward the need for progress and the specific measures they put forward will end up uh, avoiding uh, any kind of, of, severe, uh, of severe moment that would obviously be bad for China and bad for China's trading partners. All right. uh, I'd like to ask you one more. Is my mic on? There we go. I'm sure. I'd like it to is. ask you uh, one more question about uh, shadow banking in China. So. Uh, compared to, you know, the United States and some other Western countries, China's shadow banking sector is still relatively small. Um, why are authorities so concerned uh, about staunching the flow of, you know, sources of shadow credit to private firms? Well, I think the, the source of concern were, were quite straightforward. Uh, they was a lack of transparency, uh, uncertainty about the, uh, the regulatory environment and the the stability of that of the sector, so a desire to put more order, and that was expressed as a desire to slow down credit in the non-bank sector and return growth to the conventional commercial banking sector. What we saw was the problem that it was the private sec private firms that were the most reliant on non-bank financing. And so that slowdown in the growth of that credit was associated with this, the worries about the continued growth of the economy. Produced, among other things, a, an admonition by the authorities to the commercial banks, the traditional commercial banks, to increase lending to the private sector. But in fact, those institutions don't have a deep history of credit analysis. They were more used to shoveling credit to the state enterprises with less concern about, uh, uh, about their, their uh, credit worthiness. So it's uh, a need for development of more agile and a more orderly financial system, but probably a more complete financial system with uh, much more richness in terms of instruments and institutions. All right, thank you. Um, with that, I'll go ahead and open it up to the floor for any questions or comments. Uh, we'll start here. Hilton Rood from George Mason University. Uh, two comments were made at the uh, IMF spring meetings. Uh, I would uh, I'll ask your uh, your thoughts on one um, that uh, the trade dispute with the U.S. Uh, is a strategic gift to China in the sense that it will induce some of these changes that might not otherwise have occurred. And the second comment is that had China, and if China actually was a more open financially and more integrated to the global uh, financial economy, that it would contribute to more volatility, that it would make the global economy more volatile rather than stable. Just wondering on your comments on those two points. 
Yes, thank you. Uh, good questions. The, uh, certainly, there was a growing sense of frustration about trade rules uh, between China and its especially uh, developed economy partners that, uh, that needed addressing. So the fact that there, there is a, uh, a negotiation going on uh, is potentially positive. Uh, the problem is, of course, it's happening on piecemeal basis rather than a multilateral basis. And stability will require a broad agreement that whatever uh, rules or whatever agreements are reached are generally fair. And of course, if the concern is that one or another partner, such as the US merely concerned about bilateral imbalances, reaches an agreement that is essentially China agrees to buy more of this and more of that, uh, that sounds like trade diversion rather than trade cre creation. That sounds too much like taking some away from trade from someplace and uh, moving it here, which is not a good way to create a system that is stable, viewed as stable and uh, fair by, by all sides. So the deeper questions uh, need to be addressed. They will be complex and will, will take time. But your question is, if there is success and greater integration, that it would increase volatility. Uh, it seems right now the story that I think it was implicit was both domestically in China and elsewhere in world markets, there's a sense of suppression of pressures that, uh, if not resolved, would lead to greater volatility. In other words, it's the failure to, failure to reach agreement in these areas that would contribute to both the threat of volatility and ultimately volatility itself. In other words, the, the, if there's a sense of lack of fairness, lack of openness, lack of effective uh, and efficient integration, uh, that strikes me as a source of concern rather than the opposite. All right. Um, Professor Patelier? I'm Peter Botelier. I used to teach here at SAIS. Uh, two questions for John. A, will you put your slides on some kind of website because it's too much information yeah. to absorb? Yeah. Okay. My question uh, that I really wanted to put to you concerns the first part of your presentation, and it is really to ask you to elaborate on the moderator's first question, China's vulnerability. Listening to you and looking at the slides to the extent I could uh, absorb it, <laughs> it's hard to avoid the impression that the vulnerabilities are building up in the system left, right, and center. The overall debt efficiency of GDP growth, the leverage ratio, even the household leverage GDP ratio, which is now over 100% according to one of the slides you showed. It's frightening. What are the mo main points of vulnerability? What events or could trigger a crisis or bad things happening? Um, in particular, could you elaborate on the vulnerability of the financial system in relation to the real, urban real estate markets, where a lot of the borrowed capital yeah. seems to be tied up? Yeah. Thank you. First, uh, thank you for your remarks. Thank you for coming. I uh, plead guilty to too much information. Uh, which is why I, first of all, the, the slides will be available, but, but also they, they almost entirely come from recent IMF publications exactly, so to encourage those who haven't to take a look and uh, peruse them at, at, your, at your leisure. They're very easily available and, of course, open their way to more detail on almost every, on every point. Um, jumping ahead, trigger, what would a trigger be for a crisis? I mean, it seems... Uh, Easy to say, housing bubble, uh, that there's been an assumption of uh, there's an uncertainty but agreement that uh, there is a large stock, a uh, non-trivial stock of housing apartments, uh, basically, that have been purchased for investment purposes uh, on the assumption uh, the prices assume, the purchase prices assume increase in cap or in assume capital gains. Uh, this is not the first time this has ever happened 
in a, in a housing market. Uh, what's unknown is the degree of vulnerability, but the numbers suggest that if there were a turn in the market, it would be non-trivial and could have broad, could have broad effects. Uh, how it would be resolved uh, if, if such a thing were to occur, of course, would depend on policy. Would, this, would the solution be to try to keep the, uh, credit in, the credit institutions whole, or would they be forced to uh, uh, write down their debts? And uh, would the households be protected in any way from their indebtedness? Um, those are still, I would say, are open questions uh, for which there is no there's no clear there's no clear answer, in part because the degree of the problem is uh, potential problem is uh, uncertain, but it, the most likely uh, the most likely problems would be seem to be from the housing the housing sector, but it's but also local governments and other in, those who invested in infrastructure as I showed you are relatively highly levered, and many of them have uh, very poor. Uh, debt, cover, debt service coverage, so it would be vulnerable as, as well in a downturn. Um, right here. I have, I have two questions. Uh, one is, pertains maybe more to the United States, but it certainly involves China, and that is, do you think it was a smart move, or do you think it was a mistake when, when we withdrew, when the president withdrew from the uh, TP, uh, TPP. And my second question is that I read an article not too long ago about China's Belt and Road right. Initiative that indicated that they could ill afford the, the, its growth and, and the magnitude of it. And I wanted to get your opinion on that issue as well. Sure. Uh, first on TPP. Uh, uh, Good question, uh, and I would say uh, the answer is we'll have to see. The idea of belt, the idea of TPP was it was kind of an odd collection of countries. Had Japan in, China not in, Korea not in, uh, India not in. So the the big idea was let's get the the folks that are willing and able to agree a non-trivial group of countries, because it includes Japan, that would agree on some, mar on, on some uh, principles of, uh, uh, of a trade agreement, standards, and that that would provide an important incentive for the others in the region to, jo to join. And if they did join, there would be the starting point for negotiations was, would be, well, we already have an agreement. You want to fit into that agreement. Uh, that always strikes me as, even though this was not ideal and that the selection of countries, I say, left out, left out Korea, et cetera, it was way short of what you would have wanted, but it, is it better than nothing? We'll find out. My, my own personal view is that it's much harder to negotiate these things on a bilateral basis because if there's agreement, it means if I make a compromise, I'm giving I'm giving up to you, and you're giving up to me. It's very exposed politically. So it means I can say, well, look at the wonderful things I, I won, and the critics are going to say, but look at all the wonderful things you gave away, you uh, weakling. Uh, it makes those things very hard, especially because they tend to be uh, very complicated. Why it's better to approach it, in my view, uh, I, you can understand why to negotiate among 130 countries or so for Doha it gets very complicated. But if it's a smaller number of very powerful countries, then we get to say, everybody gets to say, yes, everybody got some, everybody gave some, and we all did it together in the interest of making the whole system work better. That always strikes me as politically more feasible than saying, you and I are going to get up in public and solve all this, the, the two of us together. I think it's very difficult. I'll be very happy if these U.S.-China negotiations produce the kind of underlying agreement on principles uh, 
that are necessary to create a sense of fairness all the way around. But it's uh, even if the U.S. and China agree, then what about everybody else? And if I can use the moment, uh, the really powerful agreement that would have happened, that didn't happen, that no one talks about, is TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Par Partnership. If you had gotten the EU and the U.S. to agree on a set of standards, that would have been immensely powerful. But you just couldn't get that, frankly, the Europeans weren't willing to make the compromises necessary, the U.S. wasn't willing, so nothing happened, and we're now left with these a, a renewed EU-U.S. negotiations, not clear where they're, where they're getting. So that was, a, that was a lengthy response to TPP saying that they should have been better. I'm sorry, your second part was? Had to do with the uh, Belt. Oh, Belt and Road, thank you. Uh, yes, the, as you can see, they're, 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 it's a big, it's a big uh, con, uh, topic. Um, Belt and Road, uh, the, the G20 Leaders Summit in Melbourne three years ago, Melbourne, Australia, focused on international in public infrastructure, created an infrastructure information clearing hub. Uh, the idea was there would be a cooperative approach to international infrastructure. And then along comes Belt and Road, and which seemed to have been created whole cloth uh, outside the G20 uh, uh, construct. Uh, I think that a lot of the pushback that you see comes from the fact that it was promulgated uh, by, uh, by China, uh, not, by, not as a cooperative effort, and uh, now there's an, an effort on to make it uh, very much more uh, cooperative, uh, coherent, and, uh, uh, and acceptable uh, all the way around. Obviously, good, well-designed in international public infrastructure can be, if it's well done, very, uh, very useful. Uh, and supportive of development and, and very useful for, uh, especially for some of the emerging market beneficiaries or, uh, of, the, uh, of the Belt and Road Initiative. But there are issues of debt transparency, uh, the, plant, the planning process, whether procurement is going to be seen as uh, fair and open internationally. There, uh, there are a lot of issues that are still uncertain about Belt and Road. And given, and given the, the situation, uh, market, the situation in China, uh, the article was implying that maybe the Well, I think uh, the, the, the Belt and Road Initiative is it's very large in broad design. Much of it, I think, is schematic rather than highly detailed at this point. So I think it's a matter of let, let's let's see how it turn how it turns out. But the uh, this uh, uh, current summit meeting, if you will, I guess I don't know what the formal name of the Belt and Road Summit in Beijing right now is. Uh, if it results in greater agreement on greater debt transparency, on clear rules of procurement, et cetera, could be very positive. All right, we have time for one more question. Um, all the way in the back there. So um, thank you for your presentation. I'm a first year student at SAIS, and I just have a question about China's financial system. Sure. Um, so there has been tentative measures made in order to open up China's financial account or capital account. I mean, it's still very uncertain what this is going to look like in the yeah. near future, but I just want to hear your opinion on how this is going to affect China's banking system and especially shadow banking system, because assuming that the, if China were to open up its capital account or financial account, there would be capital outflow and they will kind of complicate the, um, the source of capital in China, so. Yes, yeah, the, of course. If the question was, I hope, I, I think I understood it, but to, to make sure, the issue is really, right now it's uh, capital 
account is relatively closed in China, for example, the, the ability of private Chinese citizens to acquire foreign assets is, is uh, limited, uh, et cetera, which is one of the reasons why uh, China's participation in foreign markets is relatively small. If there were sudden opening, we, we have experience with that in the U.S., Japan in the, 19, in the early 1980s, uh, when there was a sudden opening uh, uh, of the Japanese capital account and Japanese investment firms were suddenly allowed to acquire foreign assets in virtually any amount. That produced in the, was one of the factors that produced the so-called super dollar in, in 84 and 85 that, uh, that was so disturbing led to the, uh, the formation, to the um, so-called Plaza Accord of the Group of Five, which became the Group of Seven. But at any rate, the, the point being, if done, uh, this has to be, the opening of the capital account has to be done carefully to avoid disruption. However, it seems to me that if the, it's always seemed to me, in my experience, that a careful opening of the capital account, including participation of foreign financial firms in the domestic market, is the quickest, best, and uh, most effective way to make the domestic financial markets more efficient and effective. And over time, for sure, in a more open market, you have to presume that Chinese investors are going to want to diversify their portfolio internationally. Now they're doing it, in many cases, app apparently surreptitiously, through typical matters of export under or over invoicing, of acquiring foreign uh, real estate uh, uh, on, for uh, apartments, etc as a form of financial investment ab uh, abroad uh, if the uh, if the accounts if the uh, capital accounts the financial if the capital accounts were more open in a in an orderly way and if the financial sec domestic financial sector was allowed to develop in a more uh, a complete and uh, fluid way uh, these would be much much less disruptive and threatening and hopefully uh, as we heard, there have been, uh, and it's, it's certain, there's been a, this important, potentially important change of, on the one, of allowing foreign financial firms to acquire majority interest in domestic securities markets. That suggests the possibility of bringing the latest technology, the most efficiency, uh, and richness of both maturities and instruments to the domestic market. Uh, if that, let's see if that's actually uh, allowed to happen. And if that happens, pari passu, a gradual opening of the capital account, I think would be a boon to economic efficiency and stability in China, not the, not the other way around. But thank you for the question. It's an important one. All right. Well, thank you all for coming this evening. And please join me one more time in thanking Dr. Oleksky for his remarks today. Thank you.